What happens when the level of a reservoir that supplies water to 40 million Americans is at its lowest point ever since it was built in the 1930s? The likelihood of a hazardous drought. The significance of Lake Mead was never in question, with a staggering 20 million or more people depending on it for power and drinking water. However, this significant reservoir is alarmingly drying up. Water bodies have been shrinking as a result of recent changes in the climate, and Lake Mead has now joined the list of vital river sources that are drying up. However, there appears to be more to the fast-dropping lake levels than what is initially apparent. Watch until the very end as we reveal the true causes of Lake Mead's drying up in a secret world. As the biggest reservoir in the country, hundreds of thousands of residents in the area receive energy from Lake Mead, which was formed by the Hoover Dam on the Colorado River and spans Arizona and Nevada. During the summer of this year, the lake's water levels were at their lowest point since the early 1930s due to the ongoing drought in the western United States and are now rapidly approaching the dead pool level at around 1,040.71 feet. One of the main elements affecting Lake Mead's water levels is the amount of rainfall. Due to the winter snowpack movement from the Rocky Mountains down to the valley, it varies seasonally. However, seasonal weather patterns are becoming more difficult to anticipate as a result of climate change. Thus, the lake is barely 27% filled despite some recent rises in water levels. Another factor that may be contributing to the lake's decline is the Colorado River watershed's shoddy design from around a century ago. California, Nevada, Utah, Wyoming, Colorado, and New Mexico agreed to a treaty in 1922 to control the river's water flow. To determine the river's average annual flow, scientists had to choose a specific number, and they chose 15 million acre feet. Based on flow gauge data that had been collected on average annually since 1890, they came to their conclusion. That, however, was exaggerated because the Colorado watershed was experiencing a wet spell at the time. 13 million acre feet were the 20th century more precise estimate. California and Arizona are the two states that consume Lake Mead's water the most, with California reportedly still taking approximately three times as much as Arizona. Despite both states' efforts to conserve water to protect the lake and a treaty that protects New Mexico, Congress authorized the use of 1.5 million acre-feet of Colorado River water in 1944. For most of the early 20th century, there were no problems because the river flowed seemingly endlessly, no one was using more water than they should, and everyone had a comfortable reserve in case of drought. However, New plans to use the river's water for just a tenth of its estimated capacity were proposed by the 1956 Colorado River Storage Project. Similar to its twin, the proposal was anticipated to erect a massive new infrastructure that would promote the colonization of America's West. In a more expansive version of California's Los Angeles Basin development, the dry landscape of the 1957 Interstate Highway Project would be recovered for agricultural and urbanization with the construction of new dams, reservoirs, canals, and power lines. There was only one significant problem. The design had an overstated flow number. Despite accumulating evidence to the contrary, everyone continued to operate under this incorrect assumption for the following 24 years, distributing an estimated 16.5 million acre-feet of water annually. Then the region had a wake-up call in the 1990s. Water planters investigated numerous severe droughts over the years until they made fresh discoveries about tree ring analysis and carbon-14. All living things absorb carbon-14, which they largely stop doing when they die. As a result, nitrogen-14 is created by the radioactive decay of carbon-14, which occurs in all living things. Therefore, we can measure the amount of carbon-14 that is left in dead organic matter to calculate how long an organism has been dead once we know how much carbon-14 it was absorbing when it was alive. To confirm the accuracy of their carbon-14 dating, paleontologists had to do a study on prehistoric temperatures dating back more than 15,000 years. This involved carefully monitoring variations in humidity and temperature to determine how quickly plants grew. 
the geologic record contained no hints, but the growth rings of a certain little tree called a bristlecone pine were an important early indicator, only found in remote places in the southwest. This stubborn Ice Age relic can persist for nearly 3,000 years. Numerous annual growth rings form in the wood of pine trees, which are thicker in dry, cool years and thinner in wet, warm years. The thin and thick ring patterns in these pines were compared to those discovered in wood from other known ancient trees across America, some of which were long dead in a brilliant piece of forensic science. They subsequently expanded this research to include even more ancient semi-fossilized wood, lake bottom sediments, and other markers. They also developed computer models that simulated the factors affecting the wood formation and adjusted them until they agreed with the paleontological evidence as they moved forward. By the 1990s, these algorithms were capable of properly projecting future conditions, as well as past growth conditions for every location in the American West during the previous 15,000 years. The Colorado watershed had protracted wet to dry weather cycles, as it was found as they were doing this. There is nothing as systematic as a calendar, but there is usually a cycle of dryness followed by wetness and then dryness again, lasting about 800 years. Around 1922, the wet side of the cycle was almost at its peak. After that, it naturally began to decline. The watershed is currently well into a protracted drying cycle that has not yet reached its lowest point as of 2022. Interestingly, if there hadn't been a sharp rise in consumption, there wouldn't have been any calls for strict conservation measures from the 1950s through the 1980s since Lake Mead would have been nearly full. Although the increase in population was a valid reason for increasing crops and irrigation, wasting so much water and so much land offended people's sensibilities in the 1950s. The main issue was that the majority of the irrigated land wasn't suitable for growing staple crops. The production costs and transport would be more than the market value for staples like maize, wheat, or potatoes. Thus, the tomatoes, lettuce, cucumbers, and spinach were truck crops that were paid to grow there. Although they already had a thriving market elsewhere, vegetables from the Colorado watershed were helped develop by the U.S. government, crushing the competition. Supermarket chains used federal funding to shift to Arizona suppliers, and existing grow operations that hadn't yet been replaced by California vegetables found their best clients nationwide. The Colorado River Storage Project had to show a benefit to satisfy its congressional requirement, which was done in this way, at least initially. The volume of water used to maintain excessive agriculture has never been sustainable. If Arizona hadn't driven him off the market, local growers would have created no more jobs than the farms did. Despite this, fewer people are hungry today than there were in 1950 when there were 2.5 billion people on the planet. This is because global food production has kept pace and there are fewer hungry people today. However, it's odd that Nevada, not Arizona or California, would be the state that would be most severely affected by the destruction. Las Vegas had a challenge from the start since it is a very hot, dry city that was designed without having any real water resources of its own. It may appear unlikely that Las Vegas would run out of water from Lake Mead because the Colorado River will continue to flow unless there is a severe Rocky Mountain drought that lasts for more than a few years, but it is very likely that before 2036, the cost of water will rise to such high levels that a sizable portion of Las Vegas' population will be forced to relocate. Even before that, businesses in the city and its environs will start to scale back operations since the cost of water will negatively impact their bottom lines. As a result, fewer travelers will visit Las Vegas and the exodus from the city will begin. And even before then, Las Vegas may be forced to shut down or delay many infrastructure and development projects after recognizing they might be pointless. In other words, Las Vegas will have contracted so much before Lake Mead dries up that its water deficit will be a relatively inconsequential problem even if we follow the scenario to its indicated conclusion, and it does happen. Of fact, Las Vegas has been clandestinely attempting to buy water rights from ranches and other sources a hundred or more miles away to someday import water via a large pipeline to prepare for or potentially alleviate the impacts of Lake Mead 
eventually drying up. Other governments have been affected, especially Lincoln County, by this. Nobody wants to sacrifice their meager water supplies for Las Vegas or any other city. Las Vegas has been working on a new water intake from Lake Mead that is 135 feet deeper from multiple sources to receive water from the diminishing reservoir. The most frequently asked question, it seems, is whether the lake can be artificially filled. Experts have taken to expressing their opinions, saying that while it isn't technically impossible, doing so would require an enormous amount of manpower and money and be impractical. Others contend that if Lake Mead is to continue to serve as a lake, the first step in restoration would be to close the truck farms and quickly replace them with native vegetation. However, doing so would require political will, which Arizona now lacks due to constant lobbying from current water consumers and property developers. The government hasn't developed any clear plans in light of the present political climate, and if nothing changes, Lake Mead will essentially be gone by 2030, along with Las Vegas. Let us know what you think of this situation in the comments. Is there hope for Las Vegas? Thanks for watching. Kindly like, share, and subscribe for more videos.